Hello. Whoa. All right, we're live now. All right. Here we go. Yeah. All right, here we go. Let's go. Y'all ready? All right. Why you ever chose me? It's always been a mystery All my life I've been told I belong At the end of the line With all the other not quite With all the never get it right But it turns out we're the ones you've been looking for all this time Cause I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody All about somebody Saved my soul And ever since you rescued me You gave my heart a song to sing I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Moses had a stage fright And David brought a rock to a sword fight you picked 12 outsiders nobody would have chosen And you changed the world Well, the moral of the story is That everybody's got a purpose So when I hear that devil start talking to me Saying, who do you think you are? I said, I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody All about somebody Who saved my soul Never since you rescued me, you gave my heart a song to sing. I'm living for the world to see, nobody but Jesus. I'm living for the world to see, nobody but Jesus. So let me go down, down, down in history. As another blood bought, faithful member of the family. And if they all forget my name, well, that's fine with me. I'm living for the world to see, nobody but Jesus. So let me go down, down, down in history. Go down in history. As another blood bought, faithful member of the family. That's all I ever want to be. And if they all forget my name, well, that's fine with me. I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Cause I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody All about somebody Who saved my soul and Ever since you rescued me You gave my heart a song to sing I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Amen All righty, everybody doing good? Say amen. All righty, we're going to continue our study. Thanks for being here tonight. Hope everybody's doing good. 
At least it's not so hot in here. It's pretty hot when you're just riding the lawnmower and sweating. Makes it hot. Okay, we're going to have prayer requests. Anyone over here? Prayer requests? Miss June? Okay, mother-in-law. Okay, Debbie, how's the folks we've been praying for doing? Anyone else? Just remember Robin? Brother Tony? Who? Okay. Anyone else? Gail? Okay, that's real good. All right, Mom? Who? Okay. All right. Solomon. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Let's pray together. Lord, we're thankful tonight that you hear our prayer. We thank you, God, that you care for us. And we thank you, Lord, that you're able to take care of our needs. And we ask, Lord God, tonight that you work on behalf of these people we mentioned, people we know about, even the ones that's on our heart. And we pray, Lord, tonight that you would, Father, help them to turn everything over to you, Lord. We know, Father, you can handle it. You can take care of it. And we want to thank you, Lord Jesus. We have faith in you. And we bring our petitions before you, Lord. And we thank you, God, tonight that we can come to you, Lord, because of Jesus. And we just want to thank you, Lord, that you've made a way for us. We pray for all of our church family tonight, Lord, and we pray, God, that, Lord, we just continue to help each other, love each other, reach out and to help more people come to know you as Lord and Savior. We pray for our service tonight, Lord, that you be glorified. We thank you for all things. We pray for our nation, our communities where we live, all of our families and our church family. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. We're going to look together tonight, um, and we're still in Ecclesiastes tonight. We're in chapter 3, and we're going to move on to chapter 4 as we look together tonight. Um, last week, we were talking about uh, how to live life in the fullest to the max. And we thank the Lord that uh, the Bible says that the Lord uh, desires that we have abundant life. And he provides that for us. But tonight we're going to talk about why life isn't fair. Why isn't life fair? A lot of things happen in our lives. But why isn't life fair? What is it? We think about many things that happen in our life. And we probably often wonder why. Why, is it, why isn't life fair? So we look together today. In chapter 3 and verse 16. The Bible says in verse 16, you get in the right place. And moreover, I saw under the sun in the place of judgment, the wickedness was there, in the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. And I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. I said my heart concerning the state of the sons of men that God might manifest them, that they might see that they themselves are beasts. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts, even one thing befalleth them. As the one dies, so dies the other, yea, they all have all one breath, so that a man has no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go into one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to the dust again. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that in his portion, for that's his portion, for who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? Chapter 4, So I return and consider all the Oppressions that are done under the sun, behold, the tears of such as are were oppressed, and they had no 
comforter. And on the side of their oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. Wherefore I praise the, uh, wherefore I praise the dead which are already dead more than the living which are yet alive. Yet better is he that doeth they, better is he than both they, that which they are not yet have been, who has not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Again, I consider all travail and every right work that uh, there is a man who is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. The fool folds his hands together and eateth his own flesh. Better is a handful with uh, quietness in both the hands uh, full with travail and vexation of spirit. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone and there is not uh, a two or second. Yea, he has uh, neither child nor brother, yet there is no end of all his labor, neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither she, says he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This also is vanity, yea, it is a sore travail. There are two but are there two are better than one because they have a good reward for the labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to the, uh, that one alone when he falleth, for he has no uh, not another to help him up. Again I again if two uh, together again if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warmed alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. For out of prison he cometh, for out of prison he cometh to reign, whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. I consider all the living which walk under the sun, which the second child, they shall stand up in his stead. There's no end of all the people, even in all that have been before them. They also that come after shall not uh, rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Now we're talking again, uh, Solomon, remember the Lord has blessed him, give him wisdom, understanding, insight, and uh, bless him in a mighty way. He come to realize that uh, all the things he's done has it brought him peace. It's all vanity, and he realizes that uh, you know things happen, and things happen to everybody. And it's amazing how he can determine between people uh, wh which is best, uh, which is the better for the two. So Solomon now tackles one of life's greatest questions: Why uh, is it life fair? A lot of people have asked that question, I'm sure, many times in your own life. And Solomon asked a question about uh, 3,000 years ago, and people today are still asking the very same question. In this life under the sun, Solomon observed much of life unfairness. In this passage, we'll see that he offered four reasons why life isn't fair, because of injustice. Now, we all like stories uh, with happy endings in which the good guy always wins and everyone lives happily ever after. We all ought to have a good ending. Unfortunately, we don't live in a movie or fairy tale world. Real life often isn't like that. We all know that. And Solomon notes that injustice is often found where it should be least expected uh, in courts of law. Therefore, he writes, the place of judgment uh, that wickedness was there and the place of righteousness that iniquity was there. And here on earth under the sun, the wicked sometimes prosper and the righteous suffer for their integrity. We all know that. Uh, you can do what's right today, which we live now in our nation, and uh, you can do what's wrong. I had a man tell me just the other day, it happened right here in our community, actually over in Lumberton, or I think it was Lumberton, at the Lowe's, um, two people went in the store, had a uh, filled their carts full and was walking out, not paying for the things they got. And the woman who worked there stopped them, and they beat her, beat her up, beat her down to the floor uh, there in the local Lowe's store there in Lumberton, and they fired her. They fired her because they said that when someone's doing that, 
Don't mess with him, just let him go. So because she did what's right, you, you never heard that 10, 20 years ago. But you hear all this craziness, people began to adopt it, adapt it to their way of living. Uh, and the ones who do wrong get praised, and the one who does right has to suffer. People with money have always been able to influence the wheels of justice. Uh, wouldn't it be better if every time people told a lie, uh, the nose would go like Pinocchio? Think about that. What if when people gossip, their tongues would turn black? What if every time people stole something, uh, the word thief would permanently be printed on the forehead? Think about that. Uh, would, it, uh, would you like to live in that kind of world? I don't think we would. I don't think any one of us would want this inju uh, instant injustice from God. We all, we all have done wrong. Uh, why doesn't our lo a loving God punish sin immediately? Why don't God go ahead and judge these people? You think about such an awful thing. The woman trying to do her job and lost her job. Besides that, beaten down in the ground. Why, why does God not act so quickly? And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, uh, that charity suffereth long. Uh, God is a long-suffering God. And uh, he don't immediately pass judgment, as we do so often. If God wasn't lovely, patient, uh, we would all have long noses, uh, black tongues, and condemning words printed on the foreheads. When life isn't fair, remember that Solomon, listen, Solomon affirms God would judge the righteous and the wicked in his time. God will judge. Somebody say amen. There will be a day when our patient God, uh, God deals with injustice and evil. Uh, life often isn't fair. That's why there's a heaven and a hell. Uh, uh, of what the Bible tells us in Daniel 12, 2, reminds us of God's justice. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, and some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So Solomon reminds us that like beasts of animals, everyone dies. We all going to die. Our bodies come from the dust, and all return back to the dust again. We're going back from where God made us. Also, if we think about it, uh, because of that, uh, just as in the animals, anything that appeases our bodies or appetites is only temporary. So, however, humans are different from animals because God has set eternity in our hearts. Uh, we all know there's uh, more to life than the here and now. We know that. And God tells us in Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed. It's appointed unto man once to die. And then the judgment. We all are going to have to be judged by the Lord. Okay. The more we forget about death and eternity, the more we act like animals. You know, if people really believed in eternity, they wouldn't act the way they do act. Therefore, Solomon asks, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? The word translated spirit here, it literally means the breath. Breath. Solomon's point is that without God's revelation in the Bible, when we take our last breath, we see ourselves just like animals in death. Some organizations are trying to give animals the same rights as humans. Have you ever seen so many commercials on TV about animals? There's nothing wrong with animals. But you can 95,000 different kind of food to give your dog. And it's amazing. And they spend hours and hours and hours on TV and they spend they care more about animals than to do about humans. So God created humans above the animals. We know that. And we know this because of the fact that Genesis 127 says he created man in his own image. God is not an animal. And we're created in the image of God. That's why God says, Whosoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. In Genesis 9, 6. Well, animals should be not be abused, and we shouldn't do that. They are uh, sources of our food. And remember that Jesus ate lamb at the Passover and cooked fish with his disciples, so he had to take uh, things from the earth to eat. Since humans are mortal, Solomon suggests there's nothing better than rejoice or enjoy the fruit of our works because we cannot come back after we die to enjoy them. Think about it. The point's this. 
we shouldn't let injustice keep us from enjoying the life that we have now. We should do all we can to prevent and correct injustice, but we're not to let it make us bitter and miserable. If we do, we'd be like the person describing Job 21, 25. And another dieth in the bitterness of his soul and never eateth his pleasure. A lot of people die just as angry and bitter, unforgiving, never having peace in their life. And that's a terrible way to live. So don't let injustice rob you of enjoying the good things in your life. You know, uh, we got to always remember that God will judge. There's a judgment day coming. Now, it may not happen uh, in our life or in the world we live in now, but there's a judgment day that's coming. So um, remember, life isn't fair because of injustices. Also because of oppression. In chapter 4, Solomon writes, He has seen all the oppressions under the sun. He has observed the tears of such as were oppressed, who have uh, had no comforter, and on the side of their oppressors there was power. You know, we look at the people in the Ukraine now, the suffering, uh, because of probably one man's desire, one man's desire in Russia, behind all that's going on, uh, and all these people are suffering. It's, it's terrible. I mean, you think about it. Um, let, let's think about uh, even the nation we live in in the last, say, five years. All these rights and people's livelihoods destroyed. And what's happened to these people? Nothing. Nothing. They ought to be in jail, under the jail. And, and look at the people who suffer because of it. Why should, uh, uh, what should do, uh, we should do everything we can to speak or seek justice in the world, but there will always be evil people. Think about Hitler, uh, Stalin, uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, all these people uh, that live, they're, they're evil. Therefore, Solomon concludes that uh, dead are better, they bet, they're better off dead than they will be living. For some people, because of the depression they must endure, it would be better to have never been born. Think about people suffering. Some people suffer unbelievably. Tyrants sometimes seem invincible, and the wicked often seems prosper and uh, perpetually prospering. Uh, the psalmist tells us he is devastated when he sees the prosperity of the wicked in Psalm 73.3. When he tries to understand, it's too much for him. However, when he goes to the sanctuary of God, he realizes, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood therein you know we're talking about not just coming in the building sanctuary we're talking about our time that we spend along with god it's like a sanctuary it's a time that we meet with the lord and we realize that god is in, in control wouldn't it be a a sad state tonight uh, if we didn't have the lord if we didn't know what the bible teaches us what we believe by faith in our heart and content with what god has in store it would be a, a sad situation tonight if we did not have faith in the Lord and know what God has in store for us in the future. Sometimes we forget the truth of the old hymn. Uh, this says, this is my father's world. Let uh, me for, never forget that though the wrong seems often so strong, God is the ruler yet. God's in control. So <clears throat> life is unfair. It don't always work the way we expect it to because of injustice and oppression uh, and because of people so much in like in a rat race, people seem to be wide open going somewhere all the time, never slowing down uh, and enjoying their life. Solomon writes that all travail and achievement in one's quest for success are motivated by jealousy and envy. Some people work their self to death trying to keep up with people next door. Many people work hard trying to appear successful because they want uh, their neighbors, uh, associates, and families to admire them and to envy them. Uh, they want uh, the big office and the salary, not just for the room and cash, but so they can be envied. They also step on other people while climbing to the ladder to success. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, no matter how, how they have to do somebody, they want to climb the ladder. So workaholics who want to win the rat race get 
Sometimes they forget about the families. Before you know it, they're divorced. They have problems with drugs and alcohol. They have heart attacks in their 40s and 50s. And usually uh, they are unhappy and they're lonely. All they want to do is work. So Solomon isn't suggesting we should work hard or shouldn't work hard or not do our work well. He, he's talking about the person who is obsessed with keeping up with the Joneses. However, the Bible tells us in the Scripture in Ecclesiastes 4 there, in verse 5, he says very clearly, The fool folds his arms together and eats his own flesh. You know, he just uh, he's his own worst enemy. Uh, in other words, fool, uh, foolish people are lazy and refuse to work and then uh, self-destruct. But Solomon also concludes that a, a handful of successful uh, success with uh, quietness and tranquility is better than two handful of stress, which is a vexation of spirit or chasing after the wind. There must be a happy medium. It's better to have less stuff and enjoy life more. So do you know anyone who needs this first and this kind of balance in their life? You know somebody like that? I'm sure we all know people. They live in a rat race. Sometimes such as, and some things such as relationships are more important uh, than winning a rat race. In fact, the more you work, the more messed up your relationship often gets and becomes. And therefore, Solomon writes that the workaholic, he speaks about him, he finds himself alone, yet there is no end of all his labor, neither is his eyes satisfied with riches. He keeps on working, keeps on working, keeps on working, forgets about his family, forgets about uh, friends. All he wants to do is work. And so Solomon brings, uh, begins to wonder why then is he working so hard and depriving his soul of good? He realizes it's all vanity and it's all meaningless. People who work too much usually, usually don't have any fulfilling relationships. They don't know anybody, have anybody to spend time with. Like modern, uh, a person today, like modern day, what we call, uh, if you remember Ebenezer Scrooge, uh, they work hard. They come home. They count the money, watch TV or whatever, go to bed. Uh, this is their perpetual schedule. Therefore, they're all by themselves. They don't have any friends. They're miserable, lonely. Uh, you only need three things in life to be truly happy. Number one, someone to love. Number two, to be loved. And number three, to have a purpose for your life. You need to have a purpose. Did you notice what you don't have to have is a lot of money and a lot of things? Because money and things is not going to make you happy. Someone say amen. How many know uh, if you ever bought a brand new automobile, man, when you first got that thing, it just, just sparkled like a star in the night. It looked so nice and pretty. Two months later, filthy, dirty, lost all its excitement and joy. It just don't last. Amen, it just don't last. So we now come to one of the most uh, famous verses in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, the Bible says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for the labor. A good reward. For, and look in verse 10. It says, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he has not another to help him. Not another to help him get up. It's good to have somebody you can count on and trust no matter what. Somebody say amen. One of the loneliest times in life is when you fall and make a terrible mistake, and we all mess up from time to time. We need a friend who loves you in spite of all of your faults. Remember even the Lone Ranger, he had a friend, didn't he? Uh, two are better than one, the Bible, because if two lie together, they can keep each other warm. As a man alone can be overpowered, but two can resist the attacker. The Bible says in verse 12 there, in verse 4, chapter 4, it says, If one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So you have someone there 
uh, to stand there with you in times of difficulties. So in other words, relationships are mutually beneficial and make us stronger emotionally and mentally and spiritually and even physically when you have good relationship. Life is about, uh, is it about money? It's not about success or possession. It's about relationships. Therefore, a journey uh, into meaningful living requires cultivating and protecting our relationships, which can easily be destroyed when you live in a rat race. You don't have time. Uh, some people don't have time to even talk to people on the phone when they call and have a need. So life isn't fair because of injustices or oppression or because of people who get caught up just, just doing things and never have time for other people. The last reason, because not everyone uh, won't like you. Because everyone won't like you. Listen, Solomon writes, it's better to be poor and a wise child than old and a foolish king who refuses to take advice. Does anybody know anybody that you can't tell anything? They know everything. They talk all the time. You can't get a word in. You start talking about an event that happened in your life, they just happen to have one that's a little bit better. Amen? They talking about something you achieved where they just happened to achieve the, uh, just a little bit higher degree than you did. Uh, you try to break in, you can't break in. Uh, and they talk, and the only way you can live with somebody like that, if they just like you are, and they talk and you talk and both of them talking, all you can do is stand there and watch them talk. But I know people like that, and so do you. But they talk all the time, and they, they, they just uh, always, you, you can't tell them anything. Uh, a wise youth can rise from prison. You can get in trouble as young in poverty and, and reign in success. It can change your ways. So everyone admires you, that youth in its success. But the Bible says in chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, There is no end to all the people, even of all that have been before them. They also that come shall after shall not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. This means he will later be unpopular and rejected. Now everybody's not going to like you. Everybody's not going to like you. Uh, people have different uh, desires, whatever, different um, choices, different labels, whatever. But if you think that everybody's going to like you, you're on the wrong planet. Amen? Uh, Solomon concludes that trying to make everyone like us is vanity and vexation of spirit. Now, you think about vexation of spirit, that means you're being troubled. It'll, it'll cause you to have trouble. And it might cause you to do something even crazy when you start getting under the influence of the enemy. He learned uh, that you can't please everybody. And if you don't believe this uh, truth, just get elected to a, something like a, a school board or a city council or try to pastor a church. You can't make everybody happy. You can't make it. Some people wish the preacher was a little softer and some wish he was a little louder. Some wish he'd get through at quarter to 12, and some said let him go to quarter to 1. Everybody's different, say amen. So even Jesus, who was perfect and the epitome of love, wasn't liked by everyone. Everybody didn't like him. So people who suffer from approval or addiction and try to please everyone will be miserable because it's an impossible task. You can't make everybody happy. They're just like the life of God wants you to live, let the chip fall where they may. We all need to live worthy of the Lord and live a life that is pleasing to Him. Live a life that is pleasing to Him. Now, Paul, writing to the church in Colossians, he's telling them in chapter 1 and verse 10, and God speaks to us. He said that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, that's what we ought to do. That's what we ought to do, because you cannot please everybody. You cannot please everybody. We've got to please the Lord. So life uh, is so much enjoyable when you only have to please one person. Please God. Please the Lord. You know, uh, I know a lot of people that's been 
uh, in ministry longer than I have. I know a lot of wise uh, ministers. Uh, I was speaking to a guy the other day, and he was asking questions about uh, things in the church. And I just told him that, you know, you got to stick with the Word. Everybody's not going to like that, but it don't matter because we are to please God. So what does the Bible say about it? What does the Bible say about it? That's what you have to do, stick with the Word of God. Uh, don't get caught up in a popularity trap trying to please everybody because the Word of God works. I'm telling you, the Word of God works. It's always going to work. It's always going to be. It's always the truth. It always will stand. So life isn't fair because uh, you're going to experience some things I think that God that just won't write. I think I shared before with you going to court with Molly one time because of a boyfriend who hit her. And, well, they came in with a lawyer, and I just went in with me and Molly. Well, of course, they didn't charge him anything because they had a lawyer, but it was wrong, and they knew it was wrong. They knew they were wrong. His mama knew he was wrong. He knew he was wrong. The judge knew he was wrong. God knew he was wrong. But you know what? It won't right. But you know what you do? You just keep on going. Let God take care of it. Because it wasn't shortly after that they did lock him up. I think he beat his neighbor up or something. Oppression. We all have times that uh, are not easy. We all have times to be oppressed. Things uh, bring us down, hard times. And we've all been uh, guilty of some time, maybe for a short little sprint of getting in a rat race or looking around saying, well, I like what I got, but I like what they got better. So we're not content with what we got. And the Bible tells us we should be content uh, that we have food to eat and clothes on our back. God has blessed us. We've got to be content. Don't get caught in that rat race. Not everyone's going to like you. Not everyone is going to like you. My wife will bear witness to this, and I probably shared it a million times. Uh, when people have left the church over the years, they come to church, and all of a sudden they disappear I used to take it personally. I thought, what in the world did I do to them? I didn't do anything to them. That's just the way people do. People come and keep people go. That's why you have more than one door to church. Some come in one door and go out the other. And it happens everywhere. Everywhere. So trust in the Lord always. Always trust the Lord. Always trust the Lord. I like the song Billy sings, put God first. Keep him first. Keep God first. Keep your eyes upward and don't let this world bring you down or don't let the world consume you. This world will overtake you. Slow down. Enjoy the, what the Lord has done for you and God's will in your life. Enjoy God's will in your life. And try and find a way to love those who have, uh, have not liked you. Try to find a way to love them. It can be difficult. It can be difficult. People can do some of the most horrendous overwhelming damaging things to us it's it's unbelievable what how in the world are we going to like that person how are we going to love that person well only by the love of god we can do that ask god to help you and keep your eyes and your trust in the lord somebody say amen let's pray father we love you thank you for loving us and we thought we know lord that uh if someone asked me not long ago i think i shared it already How's the world treating you? I said, not good at all, but the Lord's treating me real good. Life is not fair. In this life, there are going to be a lot of things that go against us, come against us, try to harm us. Father, but we trust you, Lord. Father, they crucified you, Lord. And you said, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. God, help us to have that heart and that mind and that strength and that power. We bless you and we praise you. We thank you for this night. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. God bless you. See you Sunday. God bless you.